All right, hi there, and welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to my space. Now we're doing guitars. We're gonna record guitars. So, as you can see, before you got here, I put a couple mics in place. These are the Cascade ribbon mics again. I've said that probably a hundred times, but these are the two ribbon mics, and they are placed approximately eight inches out. And I've got my little stick here that I've used for the drums. And what I try to do is get the, uh, the face of the microphone level with this line here. I'll record a quick sample and make sure I'm not going out of phase when I hit playback. Just make sure that it sounds rich and full. When it's out of phase, you can tell because um, one channel will be kind of strong, one channel will be kind of weak. And uh, when you lift one channel, it diminishes the other and vice versa. So. Um, I hate it. No one really likes it. Unless you're trying to uh, create some kind of weird phase effect. Who knows? Maybe you can make it sound really cool. But uh, most of the time, it's something you want to uh, avoid because it takes away the, the fullness of your signal and diminishes your, uh, your tone. So we check that and make sure that's okay. And uh, then from there, I'm going to plug directly in with my guitar. Now, I thought a lot about which guitar I wanted to play today and uh, to to lay down this track and uh, I actually wrote the song on my Squire Red Squire Strat that I found in a pawn shop for sixty five dollars uh, I bought that one for sixty five bucks and um, when I played it in the store it was like really resonant and alive and I did not have a Stratocaster and uh, so I was like you know I should just pick this up there's something magical about it and the evening before I had seen the uh, for like the millionth time I'd seen the video uh, Be My Wife off of David Bowie's low record and in the video he's playing a red strat granted it I believe it has a maple fingerboard no no the difference is he's got the rosewood fingerboard his uh, pick guard was like a reflective kind of metal thing which was really cool uh, like a mirror pick guard and mine's just the standard white one. Uh, but it's a really nice guitar in the sense that it, it plays well and sounds uh, sounds great. It's stock, the Alnico, I mean the uh, ceramic pickups that came with that Squire. Um, I did change out the uh, the trim block because the whoever I think a kid owned the, I bought two of them that day. I bought a a sixty five dollar red Strat and a uh, uh, a sixty nine dollar blue Strat, and they I think they came from the same household. And I fixed up both of them. I gave the blue one away. That, that's something I like to do is find these Squires, the good ones, and uh, work on them, get them all dialed in, and then like give them to people who need a guitar and maybe. Uh, don't know how to get a hold of a guitar or don't know how to get a guitar set up properly because it's a real bummer when you get one of these and you try to use the trim and you can't get it to stay in tune and things like that and it takes a minute to figure them out and I figured these out it took me a while uh, but but this is the guitar I learned how to uh, get a, a strat to sound really good how to get the trim to work without going out of tune uh, and uh, I'll actually do a video on that because uh, I just sort of stumbled into it but that guitar stays in tune and it sounds really good uh, so and I wrote the song on it um, so I've got this funny kind of attachment to it I'm kind of weird about guitars I um, I sort of see them as living beings you know that I'm interacting with and collaborating with and so since I wrote it on that one and I found it in the pawn shop and all that I feel kind of a, a connection to it um, I just built a flying V there's a video on that uh, on the channel as well and uh, that fit that guitar has ended up being uh, incredible and it, it took a minute to get there but it's settling in now and it's it's fulfilling like everything I ever wanted uh, in a guitar so I'm excited about that but I know that I'll get uh, craze for another guitar and I'll build another guitar and I'll get uh, you know fixated on some type of guitar and I'll want another one but right now I'm loving the Flying V but like I said uh, this guy uh, or a girl uh, is owed a favor you know for helping me write the song uh, I called this one red and I ended up naming the flying V uh, number 13 I don't know if anybody else or how many people named their guitars I see a lot of guys doing it but seems kind of absurd but uh, I like doing that so that one's red and in the flying V's number 13 and the flying V's number 13 because the the kid it came in on the box it was written uh, number 13 was written all over the place and I've looked it up on the internet and I've seen other flying V kits that have 13 written on them maybe flying V's are the number 13 kit from China I don't know but um, that one's number 13 that one's red I think red's gonna lay down the basic tracks maybe I'll use number 13 uh, the number 13 flying V for the solo. 
that could mix it up a little bit. But this, this one could get jealous, so I don't know. So anyway, um, I'm going to plug in directly to the amp. That's how I always use this amp. I, this amp, I never use effects pedals on this. At least I haven't yet. It doesn't mean I won't in the future. But um, the way I play this amplifier, uh, and, a, and a quick word about this amplifier after that, but what I usually do is turn it all the way up and I plug directly in. Now, this amp head is a GDS 18 watt. And this is basically the original Marshall circuit, the Jim uh, Marshall sort of uh, nipped from the Watkins Dominator. So originally they had this British amplifier. You should look this up because it's a it's a fantastic looking amp. But there's the Watkins Dominator, which is kind of this circuit. It's like an RCA circuit. I can't remember what made it uh, special uh, that the that Watkins did with it. But uh, Jim Marshall, uh, I guess, heard this amp or saw this amp, and he sort of made a version of it. I, I know there's differences in the circuit. Uh, there's lots of differences in people's designs that sound very similar and seem similar, but when you look at the circuit, there's actually some sometimes some significant changes. I don't know what that is. We'd have to look it up and do a video just about that. But the um, this originally was based on the Watkins Dominator, and something funny happened. Guys uh, would pick these 18 watts up, and they're very rare and expensive and hard to find because there weren't, weren't that many of those amplifiers made. And at one point, uh, Jim Marshall uh, started making bigger amps because people like Pete Townsend and Jimi Hendrix were coming to him and Eric Clapton and people like that from those days and wanting uh, more power. Uh, you know, they're playing bigger places and they're recording and wanting to get a certain sound. But everyone, found, a lot of uh, musicians found that those 18 watts record really well. A smaller amp sometimes record better than like really powerful ones because you can push the, uh, the power side of the amp harder and get some uh, distortion uh, coming from uh, by pushing the power supply and your output tubes, not just the uh, preamp section. So uh, guys would started talking about these 18 watts online and uh, the, the guy who uh, started this company, GDS, Graydon, I think is his, Graydon Stuckey, he uh, and a, a group of people, I don't know, I can't remember all the people involved, this was years ago, but they started a, uh, an online forum uh, about the 18 watt and it was basically a discovery process of trying to learn, you know, what's in the circuit, what makes the amp special, things like that. Uh, what were the transformers used, how were they wound, you know, very specific uh, technical things. And they eventually uh, ended up kind of reverse engineering the 18 watt circuit and he and many other people offer kits and, and will build and wire an amp. So this was point to point wired, I built it myself. I made some mistakes on it. It was a little bit beyond my capabilities at the time. Uh, and uh, so I ended up learning a lot about amplifier building and troubleshooting and things like that. But I, I really, really, this thing is like really the greatest amplifier. The only other amplifier that I like as much as this is uh, our guitar player, uh, Mark Skinner. He owns a uh, Super Lead, the MK2. And that one sort of sounds like the 18 watt, you know, like on steroids, because it's a 100 watt head. But um, this one gives you a lot. It's got EL84 output tube, so it's a small bottle, bottle tube, and it gives you a lot of crunch, you know, when you turn up the amp. And I run this thing, you know, full bore, because that's where the magic is with it, to me, in, in my opinion, at least for the music I'm trying to make, you know, that I'm recording. Um, that seems to be the where it shines, you know, where it thrives. Uh, the tone, there's no tone stack, there's no, like, you know, official tone stack, but I usually turn the tone all the way up. With the Strat, I turn it all the way up. With my number 13, the new Flying V build, I'm finding that that goes about right down the middle. Uh, these pickups, they are ceramic pickups on the Squire, and they put out about 3.5K uh, as far as output goes. And the, uh, my new Flying V, the, the number 13, it puts out about uh, seven. Uh, each of those pickups puts out about seven, so they're about double. Uh, what this one is. So I find that if I keep the treble turned all the way up, it's a little hot. But you guys know what you want to do with your amplifier, so you don't really need help with that. Um, but the point of all this is that I'm turned way up and I'm trying to get as much a uh, tone from this amplifier, seeing as how I don't use pedals. I'm not using any effects inside the zoom. I'm recording it dry with no effects. 
And uh, so I really get my tone by getting my strings close to my pickups, uh, by putting on uh, certain gauge strings. Right now I'm using 11s, uh, using P94 pickups, which is a single coil, but it gives you also sort of a humbucker kind of feel in the sense that it's big and thick. But there, to me, there's a little more clarity, a little more articulation. The downside is there's more overall noise. But uh, in the kind of music I make, uh, there's like a gonzo element to it. So a little noise thrown in, it's not such a bad thing, especially if you're getting uh, a better tone that you're more comfortable with overall. OK, so plugging directly in, I'm going into this cabinet here. Now this is kind of interesting, and I talk about this in the build uh, for my Flying V, but I've got two different types of speakers here. I've got uh, ceramic speakers on one side, or actually in this X pattern, and then I've got Alnico speakers on the other side in an X pattern. These are either Celestian G12H30s or the warehouse equivalent, the speaker company warehouse. And then on this side, I have a Celestian uh, 15 watt blue Alnico uh, speaker or uh, driver. And then down here, I have the warehouse version, which I believe is 50 watts instead of 15 watts, and it's black instead of blue. But both of them sound like almost identical. They both sound incredible. And the idea of it is I've got this microphone picking up the Alnico sound, which is like a softer, less focused, um, sort of like pre-distorted, creamy kind of tone, you know? Like if you were to play blues or something soft or like a jazz guy, those, uh, or just if you shape your tone with the Alnico speaker, it gives you like that kind of feel. And for me, it gives me this like, uh, like ni natural distortion, this real nice natural distortion that um, is just pleasing to the ear because it seems to mix so well with the dynamics of the uh, Celestian G12H30, which is the ceramic side. So that gives you more clarity, uh, a harder edge on the note, more slam, you know, more dynamics as far as like attack. But um, it, it kind of barks more, whereas this one purrs. I guess that would be, you get your growl and your bark here, and then you get your purl, uh, your purr uh, from this side. God, that sounded awful. Um, so anyway, that's what happens when you mix the two. Then, uh, I'm out a bit here, you know, like this eight inch thing, and you can try coming in. You know, a lot of guys put their microphones really close to the speaker. I find that bringing a mouth like this, uh, my personal anecdotal experience, has been that you just get a little more air in the recording, you know? Uh, maybe a little more room. Not that this is a great sounding room by any means, um, but I, I like the effect. It, it just feels bigger, like there's more more going on. Um, and it may be because these microphones are designed like this. Live, most of the time you'll see an SM57, an SM58 slammed right up to here or clipped on to here, and it'll be sitting right on the grill, you know, like right in front of the cone. Um, here we're just getting a little more uh, space between the microphone uh, and the, um, the grill cloth. Uh, keeping in mind things like proximity effect, and that might be what makes this sound more open, is you're not so close, you're not adding that kind of woolly bass where you get too close to a, uh, something with a microphone, and then you're also just letting the, uh, the speaker open up. There's like some space here. Now, ordinarily I would put some windscreens here, but we're far enough out. This does produce quite a bit of air. You know, when I start really rocking this thing, it puts some air out, you know. And uh, ribbons really don't like a lot of, uh, you don't want to run this like a fan on one of these. Uh, you don't really want a lot of air. You don't want phantom power because the ribbon is very, um, the ribbon is very uh, fragile and it can, uh, it, can, it can break, it can snap. So um, ordinarily, if I was pushing a lot of air, like when I do my vocal, I'm definitely gonna put a windscreen up here. I sometimes do it on the drums, um, uh, but lately I, I feel like there's enough, there's enough space between the item that I'm either hitting or uh, pushing air through uh, between that and the microphone. So I haven't been uh, keeping those on at all times, uh, but definitely for vocals. And uh, I, like I said, I don't run fans or anything around these, um, even when I'm not recording, obviously, uh, just because of the uh, fragility of that ribbon in there. So that's something you need to keep in mind if you get uh, ribbon mics. Okay, so we've got our microphones. We can check those endlessly, but we're eight inches out equal on both sides. Uh, we're sort of, cap I kind of capture like this, like the sweet spot to me seems like to be this like slightly on the outer edge here. And I'll kind of just bring this one out 
a little bit, you know, and just triple check that. It will have everything turned up. And then what I'm going to do is plug the Strat in. And this is where it gets a little tricky, super gonzo. Now, whenever I've been in studios in the past, it always seems like for whatever reason, it's you end up listening to headphones at a super high level. And uh, like I said uh, before, I'm gonna be 52 in August and I'm still trying uh, uh, to protect my hearing. I'm, I, it's actually become a bigger concern the older I've gotten. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that I'm protecting my ears as much as I can, knowing that I've probably damaged them, you know, in the past uh, playing live music. I was always pretty careful, like as an audience member, I always wore earplugs. And uh, when you're on stage, uh, unless you're like right up against your amp, you're kind of at an advantage because everything's sort of behind you and around you. And it's it's meeting, it's making its loudest point past you. So like the audience is the one that's actually getting nailed uh more than more so than you but overall you're around a lot of ambient noise it isn't good for your ears there's lots of moments where amps get flipped on and somebody hits a note and you might be tying your shoes and you could be up against the speaker and blast your eardrums so there's all types of ways to hurt your ears when you're messing around with loud musical equipment so what i've been doing and this seems pretty crazy um it, i usually have to turn those drums up pretty loud i don't know if it's just me but i want to be able to hear them very clearly clearly and feel the drums so that I know when my cues are because you know I'm trying to replicate a band playing this I want to get the energy level I want to make it feel like people are in a room together playing and I want it to sound separated and sterile so um, I'll really crank those drums up so I can just kind of get immersed in the sound but it hurts your ears you know if you've got headphones on and they're blasting this thing's blasting I mean it ends up being very loud so there's a couple of things I've ended up doing to sort of get around this problem and you may at home have some better way to do this and you'll be laughing at my stupid way but um, here's what I've been doing first of all I use the Sennheiser HD 380s I really like these uh, they sound great they'd be great. they're great for like hi-fi they're great for like everyday purpose use I mean they're just fantastic but they're known for uh, this closed back style of being like uh, sort of blocking out sound. The 280, I think, is designed specifically for that. And this one seems like it has the same thing. But when you put it on, it really sort of, you know, takes you out of uh, the sound. It sort of puts you into a, um, an isolated feel. So these, these definitely isolate sound and isolate the, the music so that um, you don't get a lot of, uh, it helps block out all the loud sound that's gonna be emanating from this cabinet, you know. So that's step one. But inside we've got drums pounding and that's hard on the ears as well. I think drums might be the worst. So uh, I've been using these irisers, uh, irisers or irisers, how do you say this? Let me look at this. Uh, Erasers, like ear erasers. I don't know, but anyway, uh, they're really cool, uh, really good uh, earplugs. They're like I think these are like thirty-five-ish dollars, and I got this little container for them. And um, they're kind of I need probably should get a new pair of these. Have been around for a minute, but I will put these in my ears. So I'll put them in right, and I'll put them in left. I don't want to do it right now because then I won't be able to hear myself talk to you. But um, they're not that overwhelming of an earplug I, I think the the literature says something like minus five but I found that if you kind of really get them in there you know and they've got these little uh, pins that you can pull them out so they don't get stuck in your ears but I found that if you really kind of get those in your ears and you get them sized correctly for your your uh, ear canal um, it does it feels like it's doing more than 5 dB for me it, it feels like it's cutting at least it's making it where I go home at night and I, my ears aren't ringing you know I, I feel like I haven't done any like new damage to my hearing whenever I wear these so what I'll do is I'll put the the earplugs in um, after I get the earplugs in, then I put the uh, headphones on and um, over, over the earplugs. So the earplugs are in, the headphones go on, and then I, you know, play to the track. So that, that helps a lot. Uh, I'm still able to uh, turn everything up so that I can feel the bass drum and I can hear the snare but um, it's rolling off that top end stuff that gets so harsh on the ears. And it's just taking the overall level down to a point um, that uh, I don't end up feeling like that I've strained my ears or damaged them any further than has already been, already been done. So anyway, 
What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this mic off because it's about to get really loud in here and I'm going to uh, plug in and just give you a visual on how I connect. So over here we're going from our XLRs over to the uh, Zoom and uh, I've got two inputs there, you know, the left and right, one in channel one and two, and you could put them anywhere you wanted. I just, I usually use one uh, and two if I'm, I'm re recording a new track just because uh, it's to the far left and it just seems to make sense as channel one. But you could put those anywhere because they're, they're all the same uh, as long as you make sure that if you're using an effect that you assign it to the input that you've actually plugged in. I've done that before. Plugged into something, thought I was using an effect, but it was actually assigned to tracks one and two instead of say tracks three and four, seven and eight, five and six. So uh, you just have to you know pay some extra attention when you're moving things around. Okay, so we're coming off the uh, the two ribbon mics and we're going to the zoom. I'm using channel one and channel two. Now uh, we are not using the rain this time around, um, and I might have done that. Sometimes I will use my uh, my condenser mic here with the rain, and then I'll use a, uh, a dynamic mic or a ribbon mic like this one for the other speaker. Uh, and that way I find that I get a lot of variance in tone because I'm already getting a difference from the Alnico and the, the ceramic driver. So another way to get a difference so that it sounds like more is happening and you have a broader uh, uh, tone to, to work with is to have a different mic here. But lately I've been liking these two ribbon mics there's some synergy uh, with recording here that just sounds really good and even and just giving me the uh, the frequency range that I want out of guitar which is a lot of high end a lot of low end and a lot of mid range I just like a lot of everything and I want it to sound alive almost like it's um, got an acoustic guitar connected to it as well I want to hear strings strings and lots of stuff uh, as opposed to just like a super tight, like flat controlled sound, which nothing against it. It's just I was wanting something a little more uh, gonzo, anarchic, uh, tuneful, toneful, like both sloppy and big and messy, uh, and then also uh, beautiful, you know, and shimmering. So I guess I just want all that. So that's hard to describe uh, in words, but um, I think I'm getting it to happen. Uh, with with the tone uh, at least it's I'm finally satisfied after a long journey and I'm sure it'll start back up again but right now with number 13 and this amp and the Strat and my Les Paul uh, I'm I'm happy with what I'm I'm getting so we're in one and two and uh, I'm not using the rain we're using the preamps on the zoom and I think that that's for uh, for these high volume situations those preamps work great and what I try to do is I'm going to try to push that signal you know, all the way as close as I can without distorting. Uh, I want a, as big a tone as possible and I don't want to hear a lot of uh, air or hiss, you know, uh, not, not tape hiss obviously because we're not dealing in tape, but just noise. And the way I find that uh, to get that dialed out is to push the signal as hard as I can. And I'm also uh, going to record this split out a little bit. So on, on one channel I'll be, uh, I'd say maybe off like uh, to 30 on the panning and then I might pan the number two channel to the right at about 30 so like you know I'm panning left and right something like this and what I find that that does is it really just opens up and gives you like a broader kind of stereo feel it really works great with uh, distorted guitars it just kind of creates a guitar landscape that you can then build upon and it gives the listener with headphones or with speakers uh, the feeling of being kind of enveloped you know in the tone uh, so that's something I'm going for. So I'm going to push the signal as hard as I can. And then I'm going to record it and try to capture that feeling because I really like recordings where I can tell that the amp was like really cranked up, really hot, and that the guitar player was pushing it as hard as possible. The engineer had it like right at that threshold. And, uh, and back in the old days, they're slamming it to tape and it just sounds fantastic. Um, I want to kind of get that feel as much as I can. Lots of dynamic uh, lots of touch dynamics on the guitar and a lot of slam. That, that's always been uh, critical to me as far as tone goes uh, on an electric guitar record. So now I'm going to plug this baby in and I'm just going to kind of uh, run this video out uh, by playing um, the track and we're going to record that and then we're moving on to bass and luckily with bass I've decided uh, most of the time with bass guitar I've been uh, using the zooms effects plugging directly in 
uh, it's the it's a moment of not adding any more room tone. I don't have to mic anything and add more more potential noise from a, a not great room. And I like the tones that I uh, get from it. So uh, I've also found that bass guitar is a little more difficult to control. So I'm looking forward to that video. That one's coming up after um, we get these guitar tracks down. So I'll do uh, I'll do uh, the rhythm track first, and then I might switch over to number 13 and record a solo with that, and record the solo with the Squire. So we have uh, a s coverage from from both guitars. So anyway, let's do it. <laughs> 